Okay, so our next talk is Accelerate Your Time to Science with Ubuntu and Open On Demand. And this will be given by none other than our own Jason Ducerone. All right, thank you, Nathan. Um, so why don't we uh, get started in here? Um, first of all, thank you all for being with me um, this afternoon. Um, so yes, the title of my talk is Accelerate Your Time to Science with Ubuntu and Open On Demand. So um, first things first, um, just a little introduction. Um, if you weren't here for uh, the impromptu sort of talk that I gave this morning, uh, my name is Jason C. Nutrani. Um, I am an HPC engineer at Canonical, um, and I am one of the not-so-ancient elders of Ubuntu HPC. Um, and so if you're kind of, you know, wondering what is, you know, Ubuntu HPC, you know, what does that acronym mean? Um, at least for the first two years, you know, I was like, oh, everyone knows this. But then I quickly got reminded that sometimes when you don't have the proper context, acronyms are a bunch of nothing. Um, so give a quick little definition here. Um, what is high performance computing and, you know, why exactly should you care about it? Um, it is a paradigm where you utilize, you know, supercomputers, um, computing clusters, and grids to solve advanced scientific challenges. Um, and so, you know, you would think like, oh, you know, what industry specifically leverages this technology? Who uses it? Well, it's pretty much everywhere, almost. You know, it's like you actually probably come into contact with like an HPC system or something that was trained on an HPC system every day. So, um, some examples of possible industries where HPC is really popular. Um, it's like aerospace, so they can use it for like modeling jets and whatnot. Um, agriculture, um, they can kind of use it to predict uh, weather trends, um, kind of understand, you know, how to plant crops, you know, what are potential threats, like, you know, if there's a wildfire, you know, mass flood or something, you know, how much could they potentially lose and what is the impact that it could have on the local food system. Um, and then it's also used in finance as well, so it can be used for like advanced prediction, um, fraud detection, um, and then also just kind of modeling potential future um, financial trends based on kind of various compounding factors. Um, and then if you see that QR code there, um, if you go ahead and scan that, that'll just kind of take you to um, a page on the Ubuntu website um, that'll just kind of go over some more um, use cases of where um, high performance computing is, you know, really popular for use. And so then the next thing that's probably like is what does Ubuntu have to do with high performance computing? Um, and what exactly is um, Ubuntu HPC? Um, so here, uh, Ubuntu HPC is one of Ubuntu's newer community teams. Um, we've been around for almost a year now. Our one-year birthday, I think, will be in May. Um, if you can read the text on the uh, front there, um, basically, if you go to our team page, I think it's on both Launchpad and on the uh, Ubuntu community website, um, it's just basically a definition of what we uh, work on. And so, mostly, our focus area is, uh, you know, how do we make Ubuntu a better operating system for doing high-performance computing? Um, and to kind of give a little bit of context about how this community team, you know, came into creation, um, it actually started at the 2022 um, Ubuntu Summit. Um, two organizations met. Obviously, the first one was Canonical, and then the second one was this other organization that specializes in doing high-performance computing on Ubuntu um, called OmniFactor. And so, at that point, um, Canonical, you know, at least me, um, we were working on doing um, HPC, so we were doing packaging, writing some juju charms for, from the previous talk. Um, also, once again, packaging, just lots of packaging. Um, and then, you know, we kind of got talking, you know, we kind of realized that we had a lot of common challenges, and then at that point, what you see on stage left here um, is uh, Ubuntu HPC. That's kind of our community logo right there. Um, we decided to start a community, start a community team that was kind of open for anybody um, to join and contribute. So you might be asking yourself, you know, if you're thinking back to the title of the um, talk, you know, what does open on demand have to do with um, Ubuntu or HPC? So, you know, when you think of a supercomputer, you look at a picture here, um, and you can see, what do you see? You see a lot of computers. Um, and so supercomputers are massive machines. So you think your laptop will think that you have an entire building dedicated to just running a single computer. Um, it draws many megawatts of power. You actually have to build it in very specific places because not every power grid can support running an HPC system. Um, and you have thousands of compute cores. You know, you have thousands of people who are all using resources on that system. And so then, Maybe some not so humble artwork here. Um, this was made by a friend, by the way. I didn't, you know, make this myself. Um, but you think like, oh, I have access to such a powerful system that, you know, I'm basically going to be unstoppable. You know, I am going to create things. You know, science and math are, I am masters of that, um, and nobody can stop me. But an often problem that I find um, 
at least you know, in my early years of HPC when I was in consultant, is that most people, they start out feeling like this, and what ends up actually happening is this. <laughs> so yes, so why do most HPC users, even though they're, and don't get me wrong, they're very bright and smart people, you know, they're like PhDs, you know, leaders in their field, they know how to do everything, you know, they're masters of, you know, biology, they're masters of genomic analysis, and yet we all kind of have this Patrick accidentally nailing a board in his head moment. And, you know, I'd like to maybe make the assertion about why they struggle to use supercomputers is because of this. Or actually, wait a minute. Oop, they got a little outside. Okay, so HPC is everywhere. Um, and so, you know, yeah, a majority of individuals struggle to get started. So why are some possible reasons why new users could, you know, struggle to use HPC systems? So I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. Um, but what I wanted to specifically mention is, you know, some maybe naive reasons of thinking, or at least, you know, easy areas to point at. Um, so the first one could be, it's like, oh, do people just struggle because it's a different tech stack? So, you know, most maybe modern computer scientists are very familiar with, say, like the Python programming language, but in HPC, you know, languages just like C and Fortran are much more prevalent and much more used. Um, you know, you could also maybe, you know, make the challenge that there's a lack of adequate um, user um, new user training. Um, I often find that most uh, HPC institutions actually have very excellent um, documentation um, how to do use cases. Um, you could also maybe challenge is like maybe they just don't understand the problem they're trying to solve and they don't understand like you know how to you know correctly model that on the computer. You could maybe say it's like the system too advanced um, for these noobs. Uh, or you could say like are they just lifelong Windows or Mac users and they're just not familiar with the Linux environment or they're just not very smart. And so what I kind of gave a little bit of a sneak peek to um, in the, pre or the, the next slide um, is that I'd like to make the assertion that what the problem really is, is this, the terminal. And so you might look at the terminal and say, why does, you know, why is this guy up here on the stage think that the terminal is the problem? Well, maybe a rough show of hands, you don't have to raise your hands if you want, but how many people would get the idea that they have access to a super massive computer that is capable of solving the most advanced problem that you can think of if all you see in front of you is a black box that's telling you to type something? Who thinks they could figure that out? Okay, so, all right, who's been using Linux for like 10 years? Show of hands. Oh, all the same people. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, so you don't even know what computer you're talking to from that prompt, and that's kind of a problem is that it's very hard for the user, you know, or a new HPC user who doesn't have 10 years of experience with uh, Linux, like most of this room here. They're just trying to get something done because either A, you know, the principal investigator, or even their boss, or even maybe they're just trying to test something out, try something new, and they just, you know, they get access to a supercomputer, and they say, like, you know, type these things, you know, click a couple buttons and like say PuTTY or another SSH um, program, and you just get given this black box. And so that's kind of what the problem is, is that, you know, you can look at it and say, in the beginning, there was the shell, and so now here's the case against it. And so why might the shell or the terminal not be the best entry point for new HPC users. Well, first, you can kind of think of affordances. And so if you're not exactly familiar with what an affordance is, um, it's basically, you know, a device, you know, maybe say like a phone or a laptop or even your car, you know, an affordance is like it telling you that it's capable of doing something. So you think like a steering wheel, you know, you can steer the car with the gas pedals, you know, you can accelerate. And so with an affordance, you know, when you go into the terminal, what it tells you is that you can type something, but what it doesn't tell you is what exactly to type, how to efficiently type it, or how to do anything correctly. And then the second thing is, too, is that, you know, the terminal can be kind of a learnability challenge. And why can it be a learnability challenge? Well, if you don't even really know what the terminal is, like, you know, if you're maybe like six years old and just open like the terminal on, you know, your Mac laptop for the first time or something, um, the shell and its complementing scripting language doesn't necessarily teach you anything right off the bat. And so the idea is that if you want to learn something new, you have to know the right places to go. Like you have to know how to open manual pages. You have to know how to use the internet, how to search. You know, you need to be able to go on the Stack Overflow and you know, who's blowing smoke and who actually knows what they're talking about. Um, and so how do you learn what you don't know if you don't even know how to learn what you don't know? And then the next thing you could also kind of argue against the terminal is consistency. And so the issue with like, you know, the terminal being consistent, not necessarily say the user interface of it itself, but if you commonly look at like a lot of command line applications, 
you know, you find that depending on the framework that they were written in, they kind of have a very specific style guide. So, you know, I guess kind of the low hanging fruit here that, you know, I could kind of pick on about usability is that not every CLI application kind of has the same interface for just kind of getting the help information. So, you know, some commands, they only support like the short option, dash H, you know, some only support the long option, like double help. And then some, you know, they actually have a built-in help command that then offers extra, you know, information for the subcommands. But it can be very frustrating when you're first starting out and you think like, oh, every application takes this dash dash help option. And then some applications don't even actually offer a help dialog. And then the last thing to, is, uh, you know, kind of visibility. And, you know, what do I mean about um, visibility in the terminal? Um, I basically kind of allude to it as it doesn't really show you what to do next. So let's say that you go online, you get something correct, like how to read a file. Well, what do you do after that? How do you copy that, say, into a clipboard? How do you, you know, maybe pipe that out somewhere? How do you further process that using, like, grep or something? Or how do you, you know, move data around from one directory to the next? It doesn't really tell you what to do. And so now that I've kind of maybe railed against the terminal a bit, you're likely asking yourself, you know, so what exactly is open on demand and what does it do? Well, open on demand is a interactive um, portal for accessing um, HPC resources over the internet or through your web browser. And so essentially what open on demand, and if you scan the QR code there, um, it'll take you to their main website, um, is it is a web-based application that kind of moves beyond the terminal that I like to say, and it kind of now focuses on providing a visual um, interface for taking advantage of your um, HPC resources. So, okay, I saw some people scanned it. But now, um, yeah, basically what it is is a web portal, and so what I have here is kind of some example screens um, of what open on demand specifically is. So for here, um, the best one that I really like to show is that it's just basically an interactive um, interface for figuring out what's going on with your cluster. So here, um, what this screen is showing is like listing jobs. Um, so typically in HPC systems, not everything is totally synchronous. Typically um, will happen is that you submit up to say like a scheduler or something. Um, and at that point, then that scheduler is responsible for deciding when to run your workload based on available resources and other constraints. Um, and so in that case, what this screen is doing is effectively showing you where those jobs are. But um, now if you did it, say, in the terminal, it would just basically be like, your job submitted. And it doesn't tell you anything else. It doesn't tell you if it's running. It doesn't tell you if it's queued up. It doesn't even tell you if it's actually good enough. You know, it could get totally rejected, and then you're just kind of left wondering what happened. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's quite some several benefits of using an application like Open On Demand for accessing your um, HPC resources. So for example, the first thing that I really like about it personally is that it has support for interactive applications. So it's not just Open On Demand um, that you're going ahead and running on your system. Um, so for example, um, you can get graphical interface to a lot of really popular um, data science um, applications. So some of the examples I have listed here is like Jupyter. Um, you can use Open On Demand to queue up Jupyter sessions on your supercomputer. Um, you can also use it to queue up a VS Code server. So for example, if you want to develop code directly on the system. So um, if you're like someone here who's really flexing their uh, H100 GPU collection on me, um, I saw him laugh. Um, you can actually go ahead there. That's how I know it landed. But uh, you can launch your VS Code server directly on that node and then take advantage of those resources right there. And then there's some other um, popular applications as well. So for example, there's like Pluto.jl, which is a similar application um, like Jupyter, but it's dedicated specifically for the Julia programming language. Um, there's also like uh, Shiny, um, which is like web apps through the R programming language, which is really popular in data science. And then you could also like look at like RStudio, which is like an IDE for the language. And then MATLAB, which is a popular um, application among uh, scientists as well. And so then moving over to the next category of benefits here, um, you also get to take advantage of say like interactive desktops. So one thing that's really nice about um, open on demand is that it gives you the ability to get graphical sessions through uh, VNC on directly on your compute nodes. So if you're not really a terminal person, if you're not interested in going, you know, through typing in a bunch of text and kind of, you know, being a bash scripting king, um, instead what you can do is you can actually launch a desktop session directly on your cluster. And so in this case, um, some of the examples that I have here um, is like uh, default Ubuntu, so you can run default GNOME, um, and then it also has support for two other um, desktop environments, which is like uh, XFCE, which I've also commonly heard referred to as XForce. I don't know if anyone else calls it XForce, but that's what I've heard sometimes. And then also Mate. So does anyone actually call it XForce or? I don't know 
Nobody calls it that? Nobody calls it that? Have I just been wrong this whole time? All right, okay. <laughs> yeah, and so then the, the, the last thing here, the last benefit that I really like to say is a scheduler integration. So you could maybe argue that schedulers is a bit more specific um, HPC knowledge, but one thing is that everybody kind of has their preferred scheduler that they like to use. Um, so some of the um, logos that I have up here, the first one is for LFS. Um, that is a workload scheduler that is produced by IBM. Um, and then there's Slurm, which is based off of the drink from episode 10 of season one in Futurama. I'm able to read that back because I get asked that a lot. Um, what is Slurm? And it's like, it's a simple Linux utility resource manager, um, but they prefer that they don't call it that because they want you to call it the Slurm workload manager now. Um, and there's OpenPBS, which is a uh, open portable batch system. Um, it's similar to Slurm, um, but it has some different syntactic differences. Um, and then lastly, it also integrates with Kubernetes. So if you want to be able to run your jobs on your Kubernetes cluster, you just basically configure your scheduler there and it'll go ahead and launch a container up. So that's pretty neat. And so now that I've kind of, you know, maybe gone through the benefits of using open on demand a little bit, um, Oh, geez, I just noticed that typing error, but it's all right. Um, it's like, uh, how is open on demand important to the Ubuntu HPC community? And so, you know, to give a little bit of historical context here, um, if you kind of look at this diagram that has been through a couple iterations here, um, we, as a community in Ubuntu HPC, are currently working on developing this um, Charmed application called Charmed HPC, so Charmed High Performance Computing. Um, and so exactly what that is, is that we're looking to leverage, you know, say the work of... Uh, Callahan and Alex here um, using, you know, Juju and Charms and all that to be able to deploy a fully functional um, high-performance computing system practically basically wherever you want it. So it could be on like Azure Cloud, it could be on AWS, um, or even on a local LXD instance on your laptop. And so the current, this is kind of the current architecture of Charmed HPC. So as you can see here, kind of on stage right, um, the first part is traditional way of accessing it is via the SSH protocol. Um, you'll basically go into, say, like a login slash headed node or a head node. Um, and then that's where you'll see kind of that terminal experience where you're now on a host. And then you have the challenge of knowing, like, okay, what computer am I running on? How do I leverage those user resources? And how do I even know that I'm leveraging the best way possible? And then after that, um, kind of from that login slash head node there, um, you're kind of then interacting with the job scheduler. So in this case, um, we have chosen to use Slurm um, as our job scheduler implementation. And so from basically that login slash head node, um, you'll submit jobs up to Slurm. From then, which at that point, um, typically what Slurm will then go ahead is you know, take inventory of all the available compute nodes, which are on kind of stage left here, um, and then go run the jobs on those. And so compute nodes can be typically composed of very different resources. They can be uh, homogenous or heterogeneous, depending on kind of the cluster's needs slash architecture. Um, so, for example, here we have like the SPAC package manager, which is a like user level application that can bring in all sorts of different um, packages. Quite a great community. I love working with them. And then it can also have some optimizations for like network and whatnot. So you can choose to use like high speed Ethernet, or you can also choose to use something like InfiniBand. And so then, now that we've kind of looked at what specifically Slurm is, you know, now we have some other auxiliary applications that we have as well. Um, so. For using users, um, we use LDAP. Um, that's just basically, I forget the acronym off the top of my head now that I'm on the stage, but that we use that for kind of providing the identity and access management. So that's how we're able to, um, you know, make sure that users are the same person across every node on the cluster. Um, and then typically we'll also have some kind of storage implementation, parallel storage, um, and that's basically how we make sure that um, files are available on all of the compute nodes. So, you know, let's say that somebody goes into the login head node and they submit a job and it goes to compute A, um, but then they also have, you know, another resource um, or another job that they need to run that also needs to use something that their job that on compute A is using. If it goes on compute B, um, it'll still be um, accessible and all that. And then you might see MySQL up there, kind of in the top there. Um, what MySQL is mostly for is just kind of collecting um, cluster data and usage data. Um, and then that way, it's like if you're a site admin or something, you're able to then just execute queries against that to see what your cluster's overall usage is or find out if you're not charging your users enough. And then lastly, um, we kind of have two components. We have COS, which is kind of an acronym for Canonical Observability Stack. Um, and so that's just basically a suite of tools for um, collecting metrics and kind of viewing metrics um, about your cluster. So for example, um, we could collect health information about all of the compute nodes, pipe that into the cause, and then you go to, like, say, a Grafana dashboard, and that'll tell you everything that you need to know about that compute node. And then the last thing is that we have Moz, which is like Metal as a Service, um, and that's basically our backing cloud implementation that we could use um, 
We're able to slot pretty much anything in there, but um, in this case, Moz, what it does is it allows us to request like bare metal resources. And so now, um, with the sunglasses and finger guns emoji, um, charmed HPC with open on demand. Um, and basically how this implementation is different is that instead of having that traditional SSH login head node where you have that shell environment, um, instead now you kind of then have another entry point that's through the web using open on demand. So basically you just have the Firefox um, logo there. Um, you go into open on demand and then you're still able to kind of fully leverage your um, systems resources so you can integrate with Slurm. You know, you still have the same users. Um, you also have access to the storage that the cluster is using. Um, yeah, so it's pretty nice. So now that, uh, the next question is, is that now that I've done a little bit of talking about open on demand um, and understanding, um, so now where does the work currently stand on integrating open on demand into Charmed HPC? So um, this is kind of something that we've been working on as a community, is getting this application. Um, there's quite a lot of steps. Open On Demand has pretty complex architecture. Um, so we've been making steady progress on it. Um, and so, yeah, basically, you know, the short of it is that we're hard at work. Um, still working on it yesterday when I was traveling here. Um, so a couple of things that we have done, um, and some things in flight, and then there's uh, other things that we're still kind of hammering out and working on. So the first thing is that we have a functional snap recipe. Um, so we're able to get a successful um, building snap package that has all of the services that Open On Demand requires. Um, later in this presentation, I'll show it, but it requires like three different web services. Um, it's a bit interesting how that works, and we had to figure out how to cram all three of those inside a snap. Um, and then also, uh, we worked on developing some abstractions for configuration. Um, specifically, it has a lot of YAML configuration files. I think you can do up to like 100, depending on how granular you want to get in like uh, the config.d directory. Um, so we developed those abstractions to make it really easy to do that using snapctl. So if somebody wants to basically say like, oh, you know, I want to be able to, I, don't know, I want like jobs to have this lifetime or something, you can directly configure that through snap. Um, and then we also have a working Apache HTTP integration um, for serving the web application itself, Open On Demand. Um, so Open On Demand uses uh, Apache as the primary entry point, and so we have that working now, so you're able to kind of start getting to some of the main interfaces. And now we kind of have the in-flight parts, and some of these are a bit complicated, so the first thing is that we have to now add a um, Open ID Connect integration, so basically that'll be for kind of the 2FA slash login um, service. So we have LDAP working, um, but we need to be able to kind of be able to authenticate our users as they access Open On Demand. Um, so working on that, um, you'll basically be able to use any Open IDC provider. Um, we'll be starting with DEX, um, but then probably looking at like Ori Hydra. And then also um, the other part that we're working on now is kind of the Nginx um, integration for running like user confined web applications. So for example, like when Open On Demand schedules uh, and runs Jupyter, um, it's using Nginx to basically proxy that back to the user um, and then it's confined as that user on the host um, so that they can't just like, you know, be like, oh, I'm root now and I'm gonna delete all your data. And then um, two things that we kind of have um, slotted off for the future then is that we want to have initial support for a base set of interactive applications. Um, so there's a couple of defaults that they recommend, um, specifically like Jupyter, um, VS Code Server, um, and then they have some other default apps available as well as kind of reference point. And then we also want to develop a Juju operator, which is basically a charm, um, and then that way it'll be really easy. All you have to do is like Juju deploy, um, open on demand, and you'll have a fully working implementation. And so now one thing is like, okay, so why is like this work still in progress? Well, you know, I just want to give a little bit of an overview of the architecture of Open On Demand. Um, so on the kind of stage left side here, um, you'll basically be looking at the auxiliary services. So these are things that are kind of outside the domain of Open On Demand, but things that Open On Demand integrates with. And then on stage right, um, those are components that go into um, Open On Demand. Um, so kind of going from top to bottom here, if you look at the first part, um, you see the front-end proxy, and what the front-end proxy is, is that basically the Apache service um, that serves up the Ruby on Rails application that, you know, you kind of work through, a user would work through to um, request jobs, you know, log in, um, they can even get an interactive terminal if they wanted it, and also just like view status of services. And then kind of then beneath that, um, you have the per-user aspect of Open On Demand. Um, so, in this case, what you have then is like that backend proxy. That's where the Nginx service um, that we're currently working on comes into. Um, and then you have the application runner, which is uh, Fusion Passenger. Um, that's like a Ruby application for starting it. And then the application itself, um, kind of all the way at the bottom. And so 
per user, um, what that is, they uh, commonly refer to it, the open on demand upstream, um, as a per user nginx process. Um, is it is responsible for basically queuing up user jobs, you know, starting Jupyter, but then running that kind of under that user's namespace, and then that way, you know, they can't accidentally access or, you know, maliciously access um, someone else's data, and um, that's way, you know, everybody is who they're supposed to be um, on each of the compute hosts, and then kind of then, on the stage left side, um, you'll see the client, um, the authentication, so site specific. Um, basically, what that means is like whatever. Um, identity and access management platform you want to use. Um, so you could be like LDAP or you could be like Active Directory. Um, the HPC scheduler, um, as you saw kind of in an earlier slide, that would be Slurm. And then like the, the nodes themselves or the network file system um, for providing the parallel storage implementation. And so now you might be wondering, okay, so like where, where is our um, work coming in here? So kind of on the stage right side here, um, this is the, those are the components that are going inside the snap. Um, so basically the front end proxy, the um, back end proxy, the application runner, and the application, or well, not necessarily the application itself, but parts of the application have to go into um, the snap. So the first part that we have that's really working nicely is the uh, uh, Apache um, front end service um, or the front end proxy. Um, that's working quite nicely. Um, so currently now if you install the snap, you can kind of be able to start navigating to some pages. Um, and then what we're working on is kind of that per user um, aspect, which is like the backend proxy and the application runner. But we do have Nginx and both passenger building successfully into that snap. And then basically now the parts that are highlighted by um, kind of for Juju on stage left, um, those are currently, we have those available. So we have a scheduler implementation available. Um, we also have authentication available. We have the node hardware itself. Um, and then we also have the, the um, storage implementation. So really it's about getting that kind of front end part um, working inside the snap. And so th there's been quite a few lessons learned um, during this process. Um, I've at least been working on it since, uh, what was it, since we released Mantic Minotaur, um, so back in November. Um, so kind of the first title here, you know, I guess a little bit playful maybe, but you know, I ain't met no bug, I can't squash. Um, and so what we've learned along the way, um, you know, maybe a bit bold there, but. <laughs> So, um, you know, kind of the, the first major lesson that we learned um, is that we needed to bundle a, a custom Apache um, with OpenIDC inside the snap. Um, so if you've ever used like the Nextcloud snap, you'll kind of notice that they uh, ship their own Apache instance. Um, and so we have to do the same thing. And so the main challenge with that is, is that um, Apache from archive does not stage correctly um, using Snapcraft, which I don't think it's actually Snapcraft's fault, so don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, Yes, so it doesn't stage correctly, so there's some like, you know, Etsy alternative scripts that don't run um, right, so we have to build it ourselves, and then we also have to add the OpenIDC plugin as well, um, so that open on demand is happy when users log in. Um, another thing that we also found is that we needed to build a custom passenger in Nginx, um, and so the main reason for that is that I believe the Nginx that we have currently in Archive only has the Apache um, integrations, um, and then the other thing is as well is that Nginx itself doesn't support dynamic modules, um, so you have to compile them in statically. Um, so that was something that we had to do. So basically, in the snap recipe, we have to uh, basically pull down passenger, and then we have to go inside passenger, and then we have to pull down Nginx, and basically then we compile Nginx and point to some paths that are provided by um, passenger. And then the other thing that we found too is that Debian rules files can be your best friend for understanding how to properly stage and prime things um, with a snap. Um, so I find that usually if I'm ever snapping something that's also available in archive, um, I just basically unpack um, the Debian package and then just look at that rules file. And then from there, I kind of have a good idea of like, okay, what needs to be in a configuration script? What needs to be in an install script? And where do files need to be copied inside of the uh, snap image? Um, and then also another thing is that source code can be the best source of documentation. Um, I know common problem is people are like, oh, the documentation says one thing, but the code actually does another thing. And it's like, what? Documentation's wrong. Um, <laughs> yeah, so in that case, um, what I really found is that I am very thankful that Ruby is so easy to read. Oh my god. Um, so we had to take advantage to make open on demand work inside the snap. We had to use some undocumented environment variables. So that might be interesting later down the line if we go to the upstream maintainers and say, hey, we, uh, we're using these features. And it's like, oh, you, you weren't supposed to do that. And it's like, well, too bad. So. Um, 
it's, it's all good, it's all good. But um, we found that source code can be the best source of documentation really because you, know, you can quickly identify if like, oh, we need to author something ourselves or if you know, maybe there's potentially an opportunity for us to make meaningful contributions upstream or even at that, like understanding like, oh, the full feature set um, of the application so we don't need to modify it in our own way. Um, and then the last thing um, is that you know, client libraries can really help um, re um, reinventing the wheel and make it easier to manage various components. Um, so if you actually do scan the QR code here, um, this is a small library that um, I authored that uh, it basically just kind of wraps like a couple of core um, YAML file configuration files that um, Open On Demand has and basically makes it really easy to kind of be able to manipulate that information. Um, and so how it's being used inside the snap is that basically if I want to you know, say like, oh, I want to change like the server name for um, this instance or I want to do something else, um, all I have to do is just you know, basically do snap set on demand and then just the configuration options I want to pass. And so now for a short demo, um, basically go really basic implementation of what we have working now. So I'm going to pop over here, exit out. Can I escape? Oop, I don't want to do that. There we go. I'm going to pull this here. And I'm going to make the text bigger in the terminal because I know that my text is too small. There we go. Sorry, I'm always like, you record, you pre record a video and then you're like, oh no, I made the text too small. It's all grainy. So here we go. Can everybody read that? Is that good? Oh, yeah. OK, sweet. Thank you. So um, first, what you'll uh, see here on my terminal, um, it's just basically a simple Biovu instance. I hope I said that correctly. Um, but what it is is that I'm currently in the Open On Demand project. Um, so if I do like a ls here, um, you should see some files. So you know, typical Git project. Um, it has like the license. It has the readme. Um, it has the helpers aspect, um, which is basically just the configuration and installation hooks for um, Open On Demand, and then the snap directory that defines the build. And then overlays is just some custom files that I basically copy in when I build the snap. Um, and so for the sake of not trusting conference internet, um, I already have a pre-built copy of the snap. Um, I've been burned before where it's like, oh, yeah, I hope you don't mind having a megabit a second, um, which ended up not being great. Um, so I already have a pre-built snap. And so what I'm going to do here um, is just do a little reverse search and push it into an um, example LXD snap that I have. And now we're going to clear that out. And then just I'm going to shell inside the snap real quick, on-demand test. There we go. So now I'm in on-demand test. Um, if I do a simple ls, um, I should see, oh, yay, it's available. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is I am going to do a snap install. So snap install. Um, and then should be able to tab autocomplete. Nice. Um, and then one thing is I'm going to do dangerous. Um, that basically just signals that ooh, I want dangerous, not angerous. Dagnerous, not that either. OK, there we go. So we have dangerous. Um, that just basically says that we're installing a local copy and not something from the store. And then classic confinement. And so the reason we have classic confinement um, is um, open on demand actually qualifies um, due to the fact that it is an HPC workload um, orchestrator. Um, so it manages workloads, not the machines themselves. Um, and there's also some aspects as well where it needs to be able to drop privileges to run as the confined user. So basically, when you start Nginx stage or you run another job, um, it needs to be able to um, assign that process the user's effective like UID and GID. And so that's why we have that. So maybe Ken could prove me wrong, but <laughs> yeah, I did that. So I guess I'm in the clear. But uh, we do the snap install. So hopefully everything goes well, doesn't break. So you can see mount snap on demand. I also pre-downloaded a lot of the core snaps that I needed as dependencies. So um, the snap is built itself off of Core 22, so it uses all the libraries from there. Um, and then also just like having SnapD available. So now, if I go ahead here, um, I should be able to run a basic command um, that does open on demand or on demand update portal. Um, so that's just basically the front entry point. So you can see there, um, it just basically quickly generates um, an Apache config. Um, if you actually want to look at that, um, I should be able to change to the snap directory. I'll clear that so that everyone can read it. Var snap on demand, common, Ooh, let's go. And then, uh oh, it's getting long here. Uh, OOD, Ooh, not PPP, OOD. And then config, 
to be able to look here, um, and then you'll see, oh, what's the uh, UUD portal YAML file? Um, I should be able to less that. Hopefully less is available. There we go. And it's just basically a YAML file that specifies a couple parameters here. So for example, you could say like, oh, where to like put the access log for when people log in. Um, you can also specify if you want to collect user analytics as well. Um, we all know how everyone feels about um, not being able to opt into telemetry. Um, and then we can have some user regexes and then just like a couple common like URIs and redirects um, as well. And then if we change up here um, real quick, and then we just change into the Apache 2. Oop, I might have spelled Apache wrong. Uh, change directory, uh, da, 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 Apache 2, there we go. Um, and then we go into conf.d. I think I messed up. No, I did not. OK, and then we read the portal file here. Um, this is the automatically generated um, Apache access file. Um, in this case, since I have not set up uh, OIDC, um, it does the rewrite engine, and then basically it will navigate the user to a file that says, hey, you need to set up authentication so people can't just log into your cluster and indiscriminately do things. So now if I exit out here, um, and I control L, and then I go back to home, um, I can actually go ahead and start on demand here. So I should be able to just do snap start on demand. And it should say started. And now if I grab the main IP of this server, um, which is 10.6.29, um, let me pull over a browser window real quick. I heard somebody laugh at me. There we go. And now I type in the IPv6 for there. Welcome to Open On Demand. It started successfully. Um, it's signaling to you that you need to start. Um, and then basically at this point here, um, the part that we're still kind of working on is being able to get that authentication information inside the SNAP um, and then basically then get it started where it will take you to like a login um, page. So for example, just like username and password and then even like a 2FA. So you could like go on your phone and be like, yes, this is my login attempt. And so one thing that I do want to point out here um, is there is a bit of a spelling error there. So I actually did uh, make a pull request to fix that. Um, currently, it is not uh, released in a bug fix. Um, so they're still working on the next release. Um, but once that's available, I'll be able to rebase the snap on that new version. And that spelling error will be fixed, which is pretty nice. I'm a contributor. <laughs> OK, so now going back to the slideshow here, um, let's go now after the short demo. And so now you might be saying, after that I've showed you here, you know, what happens after this. Um, this is kind of a rough timeline. So this is like the Ubukan at scale logo that we did, which is like the penguin waving inside the circle of friends. I quite liked it. You can credit goes to Aaron for that. Um, and then I have a picture of a numbat for noble numbat release. Um, and so you can kind of look at it and see like, oh, what are we specifically working on? Um, so the next steps that we have is we're going to um, integrate um, and Nginx stage, which is basically that utility for starting the per user Nginx process for the interactive applications. Um, need to get that working. Um, the next part after that is getting the OpenIDC um, integration going. Um, you can actually use Open On Demand um, on authenticated, but it's very clear that it's unsupported and not an intended way to use Open On Demand. So I would not encourage it. Um, and then after we kind of get that core experience working, then we're going to publish the snap to the snap store, and then that way people can start kind of pulling down edge release. Um, we basically just don't want to publish it yet until it's actually working, because the last thing we want is everyone to pull down the snap and be like, your snap sucks, it barely works. And it's like, well, yeah, it's because it's not finished yet. Um, and then the last part here is then creating a Juju um, operator to make it easy for um, site admins and charmed HPC users to effectively start um, open on demand and easily bring it into um, their clusters with minimal configuration. And so now, if you actually want to see the source code, because you know it's open source, um, you can go ahead and scan that QR code there. Um, I will apologize that the README isn't exactly my best work. Um, we'll update it later. But um, yeah, if you want to kind of start getting like a preview look at like the work that's going on in there, um, you'll be able to scan it, um, see the Snapcraft YAML file, um, some of the other Python scripts that I'm working on um, for like the configuration and installation, and client libraries as well. And you know, kind of maybe the last thing here is a call for today. So um, as this is a project of Ubuntu HPC, um, if you are interested in potentially contributing, um, using it, or you're just kind of interested in tracking its development progress, um, I encourage you to join um, Ubuntu HPC. If you scan the QR code, it will take you to our community page on the Ubuntu website. Um, and it'll just basically give some information on how to get started, as well as 
you know, ask an FAQ. Because the big question we get is like, this is really interesting, but I'm not in any way involved with HPC. Can I still join? And the answer is yes. So um, yeah, if you have any questions also, um, yeah, feel free to get in touch as well. That's pretty much it for my presentation. And thank you for listening. Yes. Yeah, we have a microphone there. Um, so I'm not sure about uh, about uh, this. Is this intended to be uh, a user interface to existing data analysis programs, or are you hoping to take over some of the data analysis yourself? Uh, so I'd say it's more meant to be like user facing. So it's basically okay. a web portal that allows them to effectively manage like the um, resources that they have available in their cluster. So for example, sure. somebody deploys like the kind of termed HPC core components, like the Slurm workload scheduler, effectively, if they were to deploy open on demand, they would then have like an interactive web interface that allows them to access those resources rather than having right. to say, use Because I, I would doubt you'd want to take on replacing those data analysis programs. Yeah. You know, many, many uh, graduate students died for the sake of creating those programs over the years. And so if they have uh, 20 years of understanding that this particular set of packages works well, they're not going to easily move to something else. Yeah. So, so I, As I a user interface, you're probably OK. Yeah, so for a user interface, that's definitely fine. And so maybe one thing I didn't really touch on that I could have a little bit more um, is that you can actually create your own applications and integrate with this front end. So for mm -hmm. example, if they had, say, these codes that they've been working for like 20 years, like, oh, they have like a GUI program that um, they click through and allows them to kind of access maybe some libraries they wrote for data analysis. Um, they could write their own interactive application that plugs into Open On Demand, and then at that point, sure. through the web interface, they can just basically go ahead and start it, you know, clicking through a couple buttons and launching a session. Is it good for interacting with things like NumPy and SciPy? Because those are some of the main things. Yeah, that yeah. Are so used for this. it can be really great for that. Um, if you're looking for like a development environment to use, like SciPy or NumPy. Um, you know, you could basically just install inside a Python virtual environment and then access that virtual environment through like VS Code Server. Um, you could also install it into your IPy kernel for um, Jupyter. But um, the, the nice thing about it too is like if you actually develop through Open On Demand and then want to like submit your jobs through like the traditional way using like the batch scheduler um, and all that, you can still do that because those libraries will be installed on the system. Is that kind of okay? Yes. Hey, um, I noticed that you had a use case where um, the on-demand user would essentially go straight to uh, a node. Yes. Bypassing the job scheduler. And I'm wondering, like, what kind of use cases that are you thinking about with that? As, I mean, is there any, any interaction with the job scheduler to, you know, to know that you're using these nodes? Is it the idea that the node's not in the cluster? Yeah, or? yeah so the one thing that's nice, um, Without saying, you know, potentially having like direct access to the node. Um, I guess maybe let me walk it back a bit. Um, so the reason why like the job scheduler kind of exists is that typically when you have a lot of these resources, you know, A, users maybe don't effectively know how much, you know, resources they need. So if they kind of go onto a node that's like super powerful, like say like an H100 or, you know, massive core system, they're going to be like, well, I'm going to use all those cores even if I need only one because it's performance, right? right. Um, and so basically what the scheduler kind of helps with that is kind of partitioning out those resources and constraining and confining. So then that way, what we kind of try to reduce is the issue of like noisy neighbors essentially where it's like, oh, if you just give everybody direct access to all of the same nodes, um, you're going to have the problem where they're all going to want to use all of those AD cores and then they're going to be like, why is my performance degraded? Why am I getting all this like incorrect results or having all these issues, and it could just be because like the node is oversubscribed. So that's kind of the problem. And so the one thing that's nice about Open On Demand is that it integrates with the scheduler. So like when you say like request an interactive session, like an interactive desktop, it'll actually make a request out to the scheduler, and then it will wait to start your session. Um, you know, depends on the cluster utilization for how long it takes for that session to be granted. But then um, once it is, the scheduler will actually go ahead, and then it will execute um, a command, which is like that Nginx. Um, and so then it'll start the Nginx, and then basically it gives a URL to the user that they can click, and it'll take them directly to that um, session running on that specific uh, compute resource. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Why is it that the software needs to use both Apache and Nginx? Huh, I get that question a lot. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, to be honest, you know, it's not 
quite clear to me myself um, why specifically that's there. Um, for me, at least, I can give a justification for why I'm supporting that. Um, it's mostly because that's how like upstream um, has it. Um, a lot of their tooling is kind of built around using Apache. Um, and I think when they kind of specifically look at Nginx, they kind of see it as more of a reverse proxy than, say, like a web server. Um, and so the reason why I, I guess they have both is that like Apache, you know, that's the main web server component. Um, and then they have like the Nginx stage with like the custom plugins that they need built in. And then that way, you know, they're not cross conflicting with like, oh, say like a normal Nginx um, instance that's like well optimized for just being a web server and then say like their custom you know, modified version that's, you know, specifically built for launching both Node.js, Python, and um, Ruby apps. So um, that's kind of why they have both, and then they also have a lot of utilities that are built around supporting Apache. Any other questions? Well, then, may we have a round of applause for Jason's uh, Thank you. Thank